Welcome everyone to the first episode of Stats and Scheme with Tage and Sean. I'm your co-host today, Tage Seth, and we're excited to be bringing you this podcast every Tuesday this year. Sean, I want to hear from you. What should people be looking to get out of a show like this? You know, I think that football has so many different entry points, whether you're a fan, you know, you have fantasy players, a data person, or if you look at football from an X's and O's perspective. And I like looking at the game from a scheme perspective. I think you do a really good job of looking at the game from an advanced analytics perspective. So to me, every single Tuesday, we pick three important topics, whether that's a player, a team, or a scheme, and we attack that from both the data side and the film side. You know, we can see where we agree, where we differ, kind of chalk up where our respective views can learn from each other, and hopefully just have a really good conversation about football. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And like you said, we're going to have three topics every week that we think are going to be worth talking about. And I'll be coming out at it from a stats and analytics perspective. You'll be coming at it from a, a film watching a scheme perspective. So let's let's jump into the first of those three topics today. Offensive personnel diversity. I wrote an article for sumersports.com a couple of weeks ago talking about offensive personnel diversity and how that can be an advantage to offenses when facing defenses. What I mean by diversity is it's a personnel that you use on at least 5% of your total snaps. So most teams use 11 personnel over 50% of the time, but then there's also these other personnel that are less commonly used that teams can use to, to their advantage. Usually the second most common is, is 12 personnel, one running back, two tight ends on the field. But then there's there's all these other formations that we saw the Falcons and the, the Browns and the 49ers and, and teams like that get into last year. And that's 21 personnel having two running backs out there, 13 personnel having one running back, three tight ends out there. There's there's so many different personnel that these teams can get into to give their offense an advantage and make it really hard for the defense to game plan. And so when I looked at this data, when you use three commonly used personnel, you on average, based on in a specific game over your season average, you're about a uh, you're about a little bit worse than than your average on the season when you just use three of them. But when you use four or five, that's really where you st start to see your offensive production jump up. You get an average of 0 0.03 EPA per play over your season average in a game where you use five personnel. So I think that's a huge advantage for these play callers as they're going up against defenses. Yeah, and I think that can make a lot of sense, right? If you're an offense that can get into different personnel groupings, you just have more of an ability to either get advantageous looks or make the defense pay for how they match to your personnel. And for me, balance in the NFL, it's not about running the ball 50% of the time and passing the ball 50% of the time. The balance is more about the offense's ability to pass against teams that want to overload the box and be able to run successfully against teams that are giving you those favorable run looks. Now, of course, you still have to be able to pass when the defense knows that you want to pass to win. But as an offense, are you good enough to get to your core concepts, but also make defenses pay for what they present to you? I think the point that you brought up there about uh, passing against favorable looks and running against favorable looks is, is really interesting. And kind of what offensive play calling boils down to at the end of the day, when you look at some of the teams that were really personnel diverse last year, it was the Falcons, it was the Browns, the Lions, 49ers, and Ravens. These were all teams that were able to get into a lot of personnel, and they did it through different ways. Like we saw Kyle Shanahan really increase his usage of 21 personnel with both uh, McCaffrey and, and what other uh, – ever running back they were using in the backfield there we saw ben johnson for the lions use a lot of six offensive linemen looks and, and really have that extra beef there on on their offensive line and the, it goes back to this favorable looks things the teams that that got to pass against the heaviest boxes last season. So if we look at defenders in the box data, the Lions were the third highest, the 49ers were the fifth highest, and the Falcons were the highest. So we can see that three of the most personnel diverse teams in the league were also passing against heavy boxes, giving them advantageous looks. Yeah, and you know, those heavy boxes, a lot of times that leads to, you know, cover three, right? And offenses, they w would much prefer to get to those passing concepts against cover three. And I think, you know, Obviously, we make a lot about personnel diversity, but it's also important, of course, to consider what the actual personnel group is, right? 11, 12, 21. But the diversity of skill sets within that group really makes that happen, right? So can your 11 personnel, you know, can it play like 12 personnel, right? Do you have a receiver that can get their nose dirty and be happy to block when you're running outside zone? Because I think something that made, you know, San Francisco's kind of 20 personnel death lineup so special was how really interchangeable those parts were. Right. So George Kittle, he can block and catch. Right. Kyle Juszczyk is a Swiss Army knife. Debo can actually carry the ball. And to me, what really supercharged it was, you know, 
Christian McCaffrey can be a legit slot receiver, right? So we hear a lot about in the summer, like, hey, we're going to use this running back as a weapon, right? He's running routes in in training camp and everything. But with McCaffrey's skill set, you know, Kyle Shanahan really, really took advantage of that. But for some teams, you know, if your personnel grouping is technically 12 where you have two tight ends, but, you know, one tight end, he's just playing like a slot receiver and it plays like 11. The defense ultimately chooses how they match up. Right. So if your tight end isn't getting a line and blocking at all, you know, you aren't getting the advantages that you think of. For example, with Christian McCaffrey and Tish, I think you pulled something on how on their on McCaffrey's alignment stats during last season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I when I looked into this data, courtesy of, of PFF, McCaffrey did line up majority in the backfield, which which makes a lot of sense as a running back. But I think what it was key was once he joined the 49ers out of his roughly 450 offensive snaps, he had 44 in the slot and 28 out wide. So you, there's not many running backs in the league that can line up out wide as a receiver. Even if they line up, you usually see it in the slot. But like, I think that him going going out wide was so crucial for what Kyle Shanahan wanted to get into last year. And it really showed with a lot of their offensive production, especially when um, when Brock Purdy came in there and and they they had some, some weeks down already of getting used to that. And when you were just talking there, you brought up, how defenses treat these situations and like how the 49ers being super versatile, like makes it really hard for the defense to do that. I think we're going to see that from the Falcons similarly this year. But when you look at like the Vikings or the bills and and we can just focus on the Vikings here, they have two tight ends that we project them to get the majority of the snaps. The bills have Dawson Knox and Dalton Kincaid and the Vikings had the, the sneaky underrated signing of Josh Oliver, along with locking up TJ Hawkinson for an extension. So how do you see defenses treating their 12 personnel? And I'm, I'm putting quotes around that for the Vikings, because is it, is it going to be treated as 12 personnel or will it be treated like 11? Yeah, you know, I think that's going to be something really interesting to see because last year, you know, obviously the Vikings, you know, their engine is Justin Jefferson. He's obviously one of the best receivers in the league. Last year, they were so strictly just a zone running game. You know, they would get two high looks, reasonably so, right? The defense wanted a cloud coverage towards Justin Jefferson. You know, Mm -hmm. they'd face nickel a bunch and they just couldn't really get teams out of it on the ground. So as you said, you know, that kind of sneaky signing with Josh Oliver, I hope, you know, that the Vikings are able to use that in different ways. We saw in preseason, you know, how much you want to take away from preseason, you know, you can give or take, but I do think they're going to be running the ball more from heavier sets a little bit to kind of keep the defense off balance. But, you know, at the same time, it is so much about getting your best 11 on the field. So it'll be curious to see how Kevin O'Connell does that. And, you know, especially with with those McCaffrey stats, I think, you know, you have someone out lining up out wide and he was actually running legitimate routes from out wide, right? It's not just his alignment. It's that his alignment and assignment combined are something for the defense to really worry about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that's a really good point. And so, yeah, it, I mean, it is it is the first week of the the NFL games this year. Now we're, we're both really excited after the offseason. And the first game on the docket is, is really relevant to this discussion. Chiefs-Lions, Thursday night football. Uh, you know, when I looked at the data for the Chiefs last season, they went from running 12 or 13 personnel, having either two or three tight ends on the field, in 2021, two years ago, they only did that 24% of the time. Last year, that went up to 39%. And so we really saw Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey take advantage of a lot of the two high shells and light boxes that they were seeing, throwing more tight ends out on the field and forcing heavier boxes that they could uh, pass against. And the Chiefs ranked first in EPA per play in 11 personnel, fourth in 12 personnel. Uh, the Eagles were first in 12 personnel. Um, and then first and 13 personnel on a very small sample size. So I think that going into this game on Thursday, the Lions defensive front is okay, but not not great, especially in the interior side of things. I think that the Chiefs are going to throw out a lot of 12 or 13 personnel at the Lions, make them defend their their tight ends with maybe either linebackers or use those tight ends in the run game to take advantage of the Lions average defensive line. What do you think about that? You know, the, the Chiefs are so interesting because sometimes it just seems like, hey, whatever we plug in, the Chiefs are probably going to be one of the best teams <laughs> at it on offense. And it makes sense, right? Andy Reid is incredible. Patrick Mahomes is great. Travis Kelsey is a Hall of Famer. And so I remember there was a short period of time where we thought, you know, we figured out Pat Mahomes. We're just going to kind of put two high safeties, run cover two. And, you know, part of their answer was obviously Pat Mahomes was more than happy to take down take some of those check downs. But, you know, the interior of the Chiefs offensive line is special. Right. I think they can be aggressive in how that they they attack you. And, you know, as a defense, you're just left on an island. Like, what do I do? Right. Do I devote more resources to the run? Am I do what I can to t- kind of take care of the pass? And 
The defensive team that I always like watching against the Chiefs has been the Titans. Obviously, they have in the past had that really strong front four, which, you know, you can say for any quarterback, right? The way to defend them is you want to at least have a good kind of four-man rush. You can devote, devote more resources to coverage. But the one thing, you know, if you just sit back in one coverage all game, you know, that is you're just putting a nail in your coffin on defense. I think, you know, across the league this year, if you sit in one one thing and only do that, quarterbacks are so, so good at processing before the snap. You want to try and force quarterbacks to work after the snap in some sort of way. You know, for Pat Mahomes, again, I, you know, if, I think if me and you had the answers, maybe we'd be wearing a, a, a shirt for a team or something, but <laughs> there, there is no great answer, but something to mix it up, whether it's, you know, I think the Titans would rotate a safety down to Kelsey. And, you know, you have to treat him as a real receiving threat. You know, on the personal diversity kind of point, you know, Kelsey is happy to get in line and block at times, right? So you can't just treat him as a receiver. And I think he's so special in the way he kind of motions into those stacks and just has a beautiful feel for the game. You know, I think it's, it's really poetry in motion sometimes where he has an option to go so many different ways and just, you know, whatever happens, it seems like Kelsey's open. So I know we're, we're hoping for a good showing from your Lions defense on Thursday. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it, Kelsey's going to be going to be one problem. Um, and I think like the the sneaky thing about the Chiefs last year was Noah Gray had the 10th most snaps on offense and ranked fifth in receptions for the Chiefs. If you ask the majority of Kansas City uh, who the top five Chiefs were in receptions, I bet <laughs> a lot of them don't say Noah Gray. But like that's like the type of things that they were doing was like it's it's going to be one problem for the Lions to pick like who is going to defend Travis Kelsey. I think that we've seen Aaron Glenn, the defensive coordinator, use one double in the past with how they defended Justin Jefferson last year, which which you studied really closely. Um, I think that might be in the works for Travis Kelsey with, with Jack Campbell and the defensive back or some type of combination of that. But it's also like, yeah, like – then if you're if you're devoting Jack Campbell to Kelsey, who's going to defend Noah Gray? And then how do you feel about CJ Garner Johnson and your outside corners that are both new and, and Cameron Sutton and Emmanuel Mosley like setting in to to defending the Chiefs receivers? So I think that's what makes the Chiefs so difficult is you have all these problems and then Mahomes can take the check down at any time if you're if you're playing that far off. Yeah, you know, there's just not really a matchup across the league that I feel comfortable with going against Travis Kelsey, right? You know, it, there just isn't, it, unfortunately. So I do think, you know, Chiefs fans may have to be a little bit patient with their first-year receiver. So maybe the kind of defensive angle is, you know, we devote two resources to Kelsey in some sort of way. I would think, you know, maybe uh, like the nickel and the safety coming down to double in that way as opposed to having a linebacker on it. And, you know, every defensive coordinator, I'm sure we all say, hey, the defense wants to take away what the offense is best at. And, you know, the Chiefs fight back, right? They make that really hard on offense. So it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun on Thursday, I think, from both sides of the ball. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So let's talk about the the Lions offense versus the, the Chiefs defense here. So I, I mentioned this to you when we did the show with Parker Fleming a couple months ago. But I think that Ben Johnson and the Lions organization looked at what Kyle Shanahan was able to do once they traded for Christian McCaffrey last year with the versatile threat of, of being able to, to run and catch both out wide and in the slot, like we talked about earlier. And that's why they, they wanted to draft Jameer Gibbs in the first round. We can talk about the positional value of things, but that's been talked about enough. But I think now that you have Gibbs on this offense, I think that the Lions are going to be comfortable rolling out their 11 personnel lineup with Jameer Gibbs and Sam Laporta, 12 personnel where they also have Laporta and Brock Wright, and then even 21 personnel where they're going to have Gibbs and David Montgomery, who they signed this offseason. And that's not even mentioning all the sixth offensive lineman stuff that, that Ben Johnson likes to do. So with no Chris Jones in this game, Chris Jones affected both the Chiefs from a, a run and a pass standpoint, and especially more heavily in, in the run game last year when you look at his on-off splits. I think that the Lions are going to lean on the, the run and lean on Jameer Gibbs early and try to take advantage of this Chiefs defensive line without their best player. Yeah, you know, the Lions have a really good offensive line. They have a great offensive coordinator. They know how to get to so many different gap scheme runs. I think they're really good at, they have solutions for different problems, uh, which I think all offenses hope to have, but they get to a lot of those in the the ground game. And, you know, I'm sure Ben Johnson hopes that, you know, Jameer Gibbs and Amon Ross St. Brown are kind of baby versions of Christian McCaffrey and Debo Samuel. And, you know, I hope to see that too, right? I, again, you know, I think the important point is, you know, how is a player being used and then how is the defense treating them, right? So I would love to see, you know, Jameer Gibbs run a ton of routes. I guess, you know, we, we're going to have to wait until Thursday to see it, but 
Maybe it's something like, you know, the 49ers started getting into a little bit more last year where they just had kind of choice routes on both sides of the field, which isn't really something that is common. Uh, and, you know, if you have Gibbs and Sam Brown doing it, you know, hopefully you can be an, an advantage for the offense. But, you know, it's it's going to be, I think, a tough one out there for, for the Lions on Thursday, but hopefully a lot of fireworks on offense. Okay, so this is the, the going to be the first of many that we do on this show, but explain to the data guy here what the advantage of choice routes is for, for the offense against the defense. Yeah, so, it, like, ideally a choice route, you're always, quote, right. Right. So if you have inside leverage and you're a receiver, you're breaking away from that leverage. Right. If you have outside leverage, your receiver, it's kind of taking three steps at the defender, you know, shaking a little bit and breaking in or out. Right. So if you can always make the defender wrong, that's a positive for the offense. Right. A lot of the times you'll have a choice route from one side and then kind of uh, it's called stuck route, but like the person will run kind of like they're faking stick. Right. Five yards, turn to the right and then break back inside away from leverage on the opposite side of the choice route. So the quarterback can work comfortably you know, left to right scan. I'm looking at the choice route. Okay, that's been taken away for some reason. I can work back into my vision. I have a receiver coming there, right? So the advantage of a choice route to me is when the quarterback and the receiver are on the same page, they are always going to be right. Unless, you know, sometimes defenses will respond to this. You'll see it from empty sometimes where that kind of the weak side, the two receiver side from an empty formation, the defense will roll a safety down and kind of bracket that player. And hey, look, the defense has devoted two resources to one player. Now, hopefully, we have a one-on-one -on -one elsewhere, right? So the choice route, it's, mm -hmm. it's beautiful, right? It's a really important part of the Shanahan offense. I think one easy way to see it is a lot of receivers, the coach will be, quote, miss the snap, right? So they want to be delayed for kind of just a quick touch, you know, whether it gets, gets a defender off balance, whether it's kind of match coverage where it gets expressed in a certain sort of way so the offense can kind of have an advantage and it can tie them up well. But, you know, definitely look for the 49ers this year where – They'll be running it from both sides, and it kind of looks weird sometimes where both the choice routes will almost look like they're running into each other. But you know, if anyone can do it, Kyle Shanahan can do it. <laughs> yeah, okay, that makes sense. And I mean, yeah, build the whole plane out of out of uh, Jameer Gibbs and Amon Ross St. Brown <laughs> choice routes Thursday night line. So let's let's go into our second topic here. Doing three topics uh, today, as as we will do on this show throughout the season. Uh, we just talked about offensive personnel diversity. Now we will be talking about motion in the pass game. Sean, what are your, some of your initial shots on the, on this? Yeah, so you motion can be used for so many different things for on the offense, Ben, right? You have your kind of classic, are they in man or are they in zone, right? You see the running back kind of from empty from the outside coming back into the backfield or the opposite, kind of going from next to the quarterback to out wide to see, you know, is a linebacker following them, right? Can we get some sort of coverage tell? But you can also use motion, of course, to create matchup advantages, Defenses will like to line up their nickel cornerback to the passing strength side. So to the more or better receiving threats, you know, a lot of teams will start and bunch with their best receiver kind of on the inside of that bunch motion that receiver across and, you know, run an option route where they'll get, you'll see Justin Jefferson lined up on linebackers sometimes because of that. But of course, you know, this topic is inspired by the dolphins, right? You know, defenses, I think they want to hold their coverage rotations for as long as possible to win that first second of the snap, right? They want the quarterback to work post snap, but you can't always do that when you have Tyreek Hill just running full speed at you, right? I think running start motions, they threaten cornerbacks. They can create softer zones underneath, you know, getting into that kind of moving stack also makes it really hard for you to be able to, to press both receivers. Is that if that's something what you want to do? But Miami was unique in that their motion actually opened up their vertical attack, which was really cool because a lot of the motion we see, you know, it's used for kind of horizontal purposes, right? You're pushing linebackers over in the run game to kind of do that. But it was so cool to see it in the pass game. And, you know, can the defense communicate and work through all that traffic on the fly? Because if you miss a step against, you know, Jalen Wall and Tyree Kill, you're going to have a lot of issues. But at the same time, we can't just say, hey, go add motion to your offense, and now your offense is fixed, right? It has to be tied in some way to the identity of your offense, right? Is it changing leverage? Is it tied to your play-action game? Is it giving your offense an advantage? And really, you know, is there a purpose for your motion? Mm -hmm. Definitely. And yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that you brought up the Dolphins because the Dolphins did lead the league in la last season in uh, motion passing plays and they were efficient in it, like 0 0.10 EPA per play and which ranked 10th out of the 32 teams. And like that, that did increase their vertical attack. Like you mentioned, you would see like their average at the target increase with motion as well as their explosive pass play rate. So, that, so that's really interesting. I think like when it when it comes to motion in the passing game, from a data perspective, 
it really just widens the tails for elite offenses. Like you can see that maybe not necessarily the, the median passing play with motion is necessarily like that much more efficient than the, the median passing play with, with no motion or, or all passing plays together. But the Bills, the Chiefs, the 49ers, the Lions, some of the, the best passing attacks from last year, whether it was because of alien quarterbacks and, and Mahomes and, and Josh Allen's case, plus these, these really good play callers and Andy Reid, Kyle Shannon and Ben Johnson's case, they all had EPA per pass motions that were higher than their, their regular EPA per pass. And so I think when you include all of that in there, you can really start to see that this, you can get really get into these explosive passing plays because of what you're using with motion. And like a lot of people mentioned, like it, it is, it is basically free to use. Like you can use the pre-snap motion to your advantage without giving away from anything else without taking away from it. And that, that man zone identifier that you mentioned earlier is huge as well. Yeah, I think that we classically right always think about that motion as, hey, like, am I getting a man or zone tell? I really want to continue to see teams use it as a leverage advantage, right? Don't just use it to process, okay, am I getting man or getting zone, right? Get into those, like I said, like that moving stack. It's just so difficult to defend. I don't think there's there's tons of answers it for it. And I think obviously it's easier to look at the Dolphins because they have Hill and Waddle. So, you know, I'd be curious to see how many teams are going to copy that and really get that kind of running start and then just not threaten people the same way because Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle are obviously incredibly unique. And then I think that Mike McDaniel did such a great job of marrying that to, to his strengths and getting him to just attack so quickly and push the ball down the field where it was feeling like, hey, this is your first read every time, right? So I'm, I'm really interested to see what teams are going to do it this year and then how they're going to be able to marry it to their personnel and to the rest of their offense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think Mike McDaniel did such a good job of, of using motion last year. But I think like the real edge is motion with play action, where you're just hitting like all the all the things that analytics people are, are always calling for. Uh, and we, we see that the average team has a 0 0.10 EPA per pass uh, using motion and play action. The league average for all passing plays is 0 0.03. So you're seeing a jump where you're going from like, let's say the 16th best passing attack in the league to the eighth or ninth, just from using motion or play action. And you can see that jump for, for all other teams. Mike McDaniel lapped the league last year and how much he called motion plays with play action. Uh, when I was looking at the data through PFF, like you can really just see the gap between him and then the Ravens in second versus the rest of the league. And this is it's it, some of the RPOs that the Dolphins are running are, are being classified as play action attempts, which I think that you should be able to, to quantify those because we've seen linebackers move. They the, when we studied this and we studied that their their bite distance when a play action fake happens, when you include play action or RPO in the model to predict how much bite the linebacker is going to have on a, a play with the type of fake, you can see a similar importance for, for both of those things. So I think that they should be treated equally, but Mike McDaniel just took advantage of linebackers and, and players in the secondary last year by doing all that. Yeah. And I think we're so lucky in week one to get the Dolphins charger matchup because, you know, it's, it's hard to sit here and think, well, how should a defense deal with this? Right. I think two of the games that gave the Dolphins more notable trouble, obviously the 49ers defense, where even after that, you know, first play touchdown, the 49ers, for me, it's a little bit harder for teams to replicate that because everyone doesn't have Fred Warner, right? He is one of the best linebackers in this league, and I think the way that he's able to get depth and just erase parts of the field is so unique. So then you look towards the Chargers, right? I think you pulled the number. It was something like 37 uh, pass snaps where the Chargers were pressed, and these were, were not with their all their first-team secondary players, right? I do like you know Staley's approach to it was, hey, we're going to challenge this, right? We're not going to get into the track meet that the Dolphins want to, right? They press on the backside a lot just to kind of throw off that timing. I think the Chargers were, they were getting into a lot of third and long situations where Staley really had a kind of a diverse bag. So I know that Tua and McDaniel, I'm sure, study that game a ton where some of the solutions seem to maybe be deeper outbreakers, right? Because on the defensive end, you cannot cover everything, right? You just cannot. So it's more on the defense to put the offense in a poor situation where maybe the offense isn't prepared for it or, you know, they're not able to execute it at a high level, but I hope that Tua benefits from that experience last year. And, you know, maybe it's about calling those outbreakers where a lot of those DBs are playing kind of low and inside leverage to take away the intermediate middle part of the field where McDaniel's going to happy to get those Dolphins to some of those outbreakers that Tua can now process post snap and just hit those. So it's, it's going to be, man, it's going to be a lot of fun. And I think we're really lucky in week one.
Mm. Yeah, I mean, we have a like proprietary watchability metric that will be sent out in the newsletter or get put up on supersports.com. And Dolphins Chargers is the, the highest rated watchable game of week one. It, it has like a 92nd percentile uh, watchability ranking. So I, I think that everyone should be tuned into this game in the afternoon slate. And I, I do like you mentioning outbreakers as like McDaniels's counter punch to the punch that Staley threw him last year. When I've been thinking about this game this offseason, I think it'll be the run game that is the way that the Dolphins are able to get back at the Chargers here. I think that the Chargers could put so much focus on their defense, on pressing these receivers and making sure that they're they're tight and maybe bringing a safety down to provide that extra support in the pass game. And the Dolphins are going to be able to use the speed of Raheem Moser and Devin A-Chain, who they just drafted, and really getting into running the ball more and doing it efficiently and creatively. Because I think last year was all about McDaniel figuring out the pass game, figuring out that he could have an efficient passing attack with Tua throwing to Jalen Waddell and Tyreek Hill. He was able to check that box. This year is going to be the Dolphins offensive line outside of Teron Armstead is just okay. But if Armstead is healthy, can you use that side of, of the run game to your advantage as well as not having situations like they had in, in the Dolphins chargers game where they passed on multiple drives in a row and weren't able to sustain attack. And it was like, you mentioned this uh, when we were talking earlier, like it was just so many second and tens and third and tens that they were getting into. If those were second and sevens and third and fours, I think it's going to make it a lot easier for the Dolphins in this game. Yeah, I think you saw, I'm pretty sure they played the Bills the next game. And then, you know, early on, they get into more heavy sets and they they get into a lot of successful parts of the run game. I think that's something that, you know, they obviously got Devin A. Chain and I think they were tied to so many running backs kind of through the offseason and even leading up through the end of training camp. And to me, you know, it's a good spot to kind of transition to our third topic, which is gap scheme runs. And it's something that I'm going to be, you know, p- p- pounding the table for, I think, all year. And I'm always going to understand, right? I know that... Passing is always going to be more efficient than running, but you know, gap scheme runs are interesting, right? The NFL, it's a zone running league, right? Outside zone and inside zone. They're going to lead the way pretty much every year. We're going to continue to have that spread of the Shanahan tree every single cycle. And your know, offense is kind of punched back against the Pete Carroll defenses with more outside zone concepts and then play action concepts off that. That just cause a ton of issues for one high defenses. You know, linebackers had a hard time getting that depth of the crossers and the defense has really had to find a way to adjust, right? Of course, we famously saw the 6-1 defense in the Super Bowl against the Rams, but now teams are more comfortable playing light boxes against the run where they look like they're light boxes, but really that seventh defender is just coming from depth and, you know, they can take care of those cross routes in different ways. So to me, you know, this year is a big year for the offense to swing back and kind of get that upside of the pendulum, hopefully. And I think the best way to do that is through gap scheme runs, right? Those gap scheme runs include... You know, counter, power, trap, and wham. Those are really the most common ones. And they let the offensive line be aggressive vertically in their double teams or really just slamming down with force and using the leverage of the defense against them, right? A lot of times you'll be kind of pushing. It looks like you're pushing one side of the line down and then a puller will be coming across. And you know, that can make the life harder on the defense really easily by just out leveraging them so quick. And I think that the running back position, it's different for them because in zone running, it's, really hard right you're reading one gap at a time and it's it's i think a lot of art involved in that and it's not every running back can't just develop that skill set overnight where on these gap scheme runs you know you are hitting a gap now and getting downhill right i think we're going to see a lot of it on thursday with the lions and even when defenses you know if they try and spill those runs out to safeties kind of coming down off the roof you know it's nice to say that but when the double teams are hitting right you're getting that vertical movement and gaps are opening it causes a lot of issues for defenses. And I think that the way that defense is playing now, especially with those kind of edge defenders that really, hey, we want to set the edge against that outside run. Offenses are going to hopefully be able to do a better job. And of course, I'm always going to keep citing the 49ers. They do a really good job of figuring out, hey, we can just hammer out this edge defender. We can push down the defensive line, open up that gap and get our guy vertical really quickly. So before I go into the data here, I just want to make sure that my train of thought is kind of aligned with yours with the, in respect to kind of the shift from, from zone runs to gap scene runs. So how I kind of saw it was, I think 2018, what the Rams offense was able to do with Todd Gurley leading the way for, for most of the season, having one of the most efficient rushing attacks that we've seen 
of the past five, 10 years in the NFL. And they did it without a mobile quarterback too, which, which was really offensive, uh, impressive was you had a lot of outside zone, inside zone runs. And that kind of led this revolution of the next couple of years in the NFL, where I think about Derrick Henry's best season in 2020, that being a very heavy zone team. And now the, the shift is starting to go back to these, these gap scheme runs where, um, where defenses have gotten used to, to zone runs and like the, the counter punch that the offenses are throwing is happening. Is that, is that kind of how you see it as well? Yeah, I think so. Right? I, I don't like to just think about football as going from, you know, Hey, th- like it, like X happened one and the exact opposite happens kind of, it swings back and forth to me. It's more of like, it's kind of in the middle of that where things are just kind of molding constantly. So the mm-hmm. defense reacts to those more outside zone runs defenses to me, but they're just better at playing the outside zone game. And I think the inside zone game, because of the way that, you know, those interior defensive linemen, they clog up double teams really well. I think that the defensive coordinators have gotten a little bit better about, you know, how do I manipulate the center in that the center can't climb to their double team as quickly. And so if your defense is really, really lined up in that way and they're playing a technique where it's kind of more, maybe a little bit more of a reactionary technique from the defensive line, the way to get that is let me attack that like vertically downhill, right? Mm-hmm. I do think that this year on the defensive side, a lot of, it seems like offensive coordinator head coach are tired of seeing their defense. Like the Vikings are an easy example where, you know, Ed Dontel came from that Fangio tree and, you know, maybe all of the kind of front mechanics that Fangio is so good at weren't, uh, done to the same level based on personnel or whatever reason. So it seems like some coaches are tired of seeing the, hey, we're going to let you kind of matriculate the ball down the field through the run game slowly and get to more kind of those attacking, you know, I'm playing this gap as fast as I can, that more kind of 49er style of defense. So it's definitely, it's a swing back and forth, but I do think defenses are more accustomed to dealing with the zone game. It's a little bit harder for offenses because, you know, not everyone has Kyle Juszczyk, not everyone has George Kittle, not everyone has that kind of fullback personnel, that tight end personnel. And for the offense, obviously, you know, get your best 11 on the field, figure out your way to do that. So now it goes to the defense can play zone better. They're maybe not as equipped to play against the gap team game, whether they're lighter at the first level or even the second level. And now offenses, I think, should get to that. They, and it seems like they have gotten to that a little bit, uh, at least for some teams last season. I agree with that. And like the data does back up a lot of what you're saying. Like when when PFF charts run schemes, we can we can kind of take a look at how that shifted over time. Inside zone has gone from being called 30% of all rushes in 2018 to 22% in 2022. So we can see an eight percentage point drop off in that. And then conversely, counter has been has gone from being called 4% of the time in 2018 to 7% in 2022. So almost doubling the rate of counter uh, league wide we've seen. And then the teams that led the league in counter last year were the Ravens at 26%, the Cardinals at 15%, the Eagles at 12%, the Chiefs at 12%, and the Buccaneers at 12%, with the Lions and 49ers coming in at 11 and 10%. So from my perspective, it looks like counter seems to be easier or more advantageous with a mobile quarterback. You look at the Ravens with Lamar Jackson, the Cardinals with Kyler Murray, Eagles with Jalen Hurts, and then the what the Chiefs were able to do with Patrick Mahomes, who's not necessarily... Uh, classify as like a pure mobile quarterback, but like someone who can run and, and scramble and and do design runs if he has to really well. Is that kind of what you see when you dig into the film on, on counter rushes? Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, a quarterback that can run is just such a cheat code in so many ways. I think, you know, even like some level of mobility is so important. I think it's going to be really hard for us to see, you know, a first overall pick drafted quarterback coming up in the next however many years that just has no mobility, right? Like that, mm-hmm archetype of player is just kind of removed now of course i mean lamar jackson is you know one of the best mobile quarterbacks of our generation so and i do think he's a great passer too so it's not that he's just <laughs> kind of grown on trees and happening but i do think that with mobile quarterbacks teams can just get two different run schemes right and anything that mm-hmm. causes the linebackers extra hesitation you know that's just difficult for a defense to deal with i think that the 49ers who i'm just gonna keep talking about right they're unique in that their gap scheme and there or what kind of looks like their gap scheme and their zone they teach so many parts of it similarly there's a really good clinic out there on uh i think their offensive line coach the run game coordinator talking about it and so it makes life so hard on the linebackers right i think that linebackers are just always a microscope gets put on them they have so many keys to read even the ways that you know the modern rpos are run where the refs you know whatever the rule is whether it's one yard whether it's a gray area like a linebacker has a player running at them they're reading their key but they're still in the wrong alignment just based on you know how Mm -hmm. kind of versatile an offense can be so 
I think with the other points where we say, it's not just a solve all to say, hey, get your offense, personnel diverse, or use motion in the pass game. It's the same thing with gap scheme runs, right? You have to see, you know, is your offensive line actually good at it, right? Do you have the coaches that are good for teaching it? You know, can you problem solve against the different fronts and movements that you're going to face on a week-to-week basis? I think that is a huge, huge problem, especially at the, co- the college level, it's interesting uh, because there's so many different fronts and movements that you see on a snap-to-snap basis where it's a lot more than the NFL. But I think the Dolphins were really good at also getting to their play action series while they were pulling guards in protection where it, it felt like, hey, there's an actual marriage here where the gap scheme play actions actually look like the gap scheme runs. So, you know, is that, are you going to be a team where every single time you pull a guard, the defense can say, hey, look, this is play action, right? So you need to be able to have something that is combining those two together. Like, I think that Shanahan's a great example or I remember mean, the best offensive play callers are where it's like, hey, we have our base concept. We have our counter off that. We have a counter off the counter. And we have one more counter off of that. And then now your head's just kind of <laughs> spinning. So, you know, I'm always going to understand. I got to say all year runs aren't as efficient as passes, but you have to, I think, be varied in the run game to take advantage of how that defense wants to match up your pers- against your personnel and really just find a way to give your offense an advantage. I definitely agree. And we talked about offensive personnel diversity at length at the beginning of this. I'm sure that that run scheme diversity, even though I haven't dug into the, the data on that, but I'm sure that there's a similar effect in that regard. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought up linebackers and the trouble that they have moving. When when I looked at the data about this with Eric Eager, the, the co-host of this podcast on, on Mondays and Wednesdays, we found that linebackers cover less ground against counter runs than they do inside zone. And so that jump in counter and that decrease in inside zone starts to make sense if you think about the ways that maybe teams are using this tracking data to look at the same thing and, and giving coaches the same report. Linebackers had a lot of trouble covering ground against pull leads and draws, which are kind of, you know, in a similar bucket of like, they're not pure zone runs where the, the offensive linemen are moving in the same direction. And there's, there's some type of trick I like to call it happening in, in that regard. So when you look at the way that linebackers are being manipulated and moved around by defenses, I think about the, the Steven Ruiz, uh, Kyle Shanahan microscope meme <laughs> where he picks a, a player on the defense every week that Kyle Shanahan will, will zero in on. Oftentimes it is one of these linebacker types that maybe is over aggressive in the run game can be moved off of his spot. And then the, the gap can go on the other side of that and, and be taken advantage of Tish, uh, linebackers, you know, their job is just too hard, right? They have so <laughs> yeah. many things going mm-hmm. on and whatever area you're reading, whether, you know, they're reading a triangle in some sort of way and feeling kind of movers are uh, like linemen blocking down and a puller coming across it, you know, even when they feel it now, I think teams do a really good job of, you know, having that receiver slam down and kind of crack that, that player as well and gosh you know I'm, I'm excited that we can you know push a little bit of narrative about the run game on this podcast you know i'm gonna, I'm gonna stick up for it and and see what offenses do going forward this year definitely and be, you know before we close off here i do want to just talk about the ravens offense briefly so again like they they had 26 percent of their rushes last year being counter we know that greg roman going all the way back to his stanford days has been one of the best run game coordinators in any type of football, but his past game left some meat on the bone for sure. So Todd Monken comes in, uh, specializes in the the past game, scheming up the past game. We saw it last year at Georgia uh, with how he was able to use Brock Bowers and, and Darnell Washington. Uh, and, and as they have they were able to take advantage of defenses uh, through, through two tight end sets. Do you see the Ravens offense as having a step back in the run game at the expense of having a step forward in the passing game. Do you think that Lamar is that good of a rusher where he's able to keep a high floor on the run game and able to increase the ceiling of the passing game? How does that kind of feel out for you as they head into their week one matchup against the Texans? Yeah. You know, those are really interesting questions. I think very highly of Lamar Jackson and it's not just because I use the Ravens as my Madden team. You know, I do (laughs) think that he has shown a really good ability in the passing game. I think I think it was Stephen Ruiz who pulled this. Stephen gets a second shout out on the show today where it was Lamar's running stats uh, from like open sets. So no tight ends attached, whether that's four receivers, uh, two by two or three by one. And they were really, really good. Right. So I think that Lamar is a special runner. And even if the whole entire plane isn't built out of those condensed sets, uh, that kind of gap scheme oriented game, I can't. I mean, 26 percent is really high. Right. I would be Mm -hmm. surprised if it's that same number where it seems like even Pat Ricard, unfortunately, is getting used in kind of a different way. You know, he's someone that I'm always going to have a lot of heart for, you know, anyone that lines up at that fullback position. So 
I do think that the Ravens offense, it's going to have just different buttons to press, right? Whether it's manipulating tempo. I think the Ravens have like the longest time in between snaps, right? They played an entire different kind of game that I think they will this year, right? Where they'll, they should have success on the ground, but getting to more of those diverse uh, pass concepts, I think as I keep pushing this pa pass is obviously is more efficient than running. And I think the Ravens understand that too, right? Monken's going to get to more diverse uh, passing concepts where it's not just, hey, I got, you know, kind of four people breaking in at the same point or people that are just kind of set in one spot. I think, you know, Mark Andrews is hopefully set in for another really, really good year. I think Odo Beckham's an incredible addition there too. And it gives Lamar just a unique set of receivers that, you know, kind of leading through a lot of the themes we were talking about today, defenses are going to be kept more off balance, right? It's not just going to mm -hmm. be, Lamar looking at one receiver or receiver stopping and turning around. I think Monken did a good job at Georgia of understanding how to manipulate through formation. And they were obviously able to use the hashes in different ways where they are able to get into different concepts in the boundary, whereas the NFL, sometimes you condense to get to those concepts. But extremely optimistic for the Ravens. I know that division is, is definitely tough, but that's going to be a fun one, certainly to watch week one against, uh, I think they're playing the Texans, right? Domingo Ryans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it'll be, it'll be interesting. And yeah, the hashes point is is uh really intriguing to bring up like after only watching preseason football for the past month there was a lot of college football to watch <laughs> this weekend uh, especially colorado tcu was was the really big game a lot of people were watching lsu florida state was the other one and like when you just look at these offenses and you see how they're able to use the hashes and like what how the boundary kind of limits them. Um, I think like even Duke against Clemson, they lined up in a, a four by one set where the the four receivers were were on the boundary side, like on on the side of that that the hash was lined up on, which I thought was really interesting. It is really like a, a different game versus versus the NFL. So it'll be really cool to see how Todd Monken takes some of those concepts and applies it, but also changes up some of the things that he was able to do at Georgia that he's he might not be able to do in the NFL, but. I am excited for them to get the opportunity. I mean, the, the Texans defense isn't bad. Like they, they ranked um, 19th in, in defensive EPA per play last year, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and then they, they, they you throw in D'Amico Ryans, who's one of the best defensive play callers in the NFL. But so it'll be a cool battle to see how the Ravens offense goes against the Texans defense. Yeah. And something on the, the hashes point is interesting, right? A lot of teams will run that kind of FIB formation in the boundary kind of, sets at college where at the pro level or like you can't or usually don't have someone playing like a deep half to the widest side of the field in college usually you know some teams are able to do it but what i do like about you know in the nfl like you can kind of look at okay if i'm playing deep halves i can you know i can play to the wider side obviously i'm not saying it's easy in any way and it, it makes your cover one looks differently so you know tej i know you know that i love i think pro football a little more than college football uh at times but a lot obviously a lot of that schematic innovation is going to come from kind of from college up and I'm, that'll be interesting to track too as offenses uh at the college level i think got to get more gap scheme especially you know counter from the gun concepts over the last four years as a response right it was almost college was happening before the nfl mm -hmm. definitely and and yeah i mean i think i think like this whole weekend between college and nfl football with tulane ole miss like lane kiffin is, is one of the best play callers in, in college football in a primetime game, top 25 matchup. Then you have obviously Texas, Alabama at night. Steve Sarkeesian is, is one of the best play callers in college football as well. Uh, Texas had a lot of weapons and, and a pretty good quarterback this year. So that'll be, that'll be cool to see. And then we have all the NFL games <laughs> on Sunday that, that we can get into a really good one on Monday night as well that, that people can watch in Jets bills. So we, we appreciate everyone listening to this first episode of stats and scheme. Sean, I, I really enjoyed this and I hope the listeners enjoyed as well. If you have any feedback, good or bad, please let us know. Uh, you can, you can DM us on Twitter. You can, you can shoot us a, a message and, and let us know or, or, or say something in the comments of the YouTube video. And, you know, be sure to listen to the rest of the Sumer Sports Show lineups. There's Eric Eager and Thomas Dimitrov on Mondays and Wednesdays, as well as Parker Fleming's show, The Odd Man Front, on Thursdays. This show will come out Tuesday afternoons and hopefully be available for people to listen Tuesday evening and into Wednesday morning. So we, we appreciate everyone again for listening, and we will see you all next week.